Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you as we gather together to worship the Lord who is worthy of our praise. And a special welcome to those visiting with us back home among us. You're very welcome as we meet here uh, in Tober Quay. The announcements have been scrolling there. Hopefully the things that, that, that are taking place, the, the Herald magazines, the latest edition is there. If you haven't collected them, if you order those, they're there in the porch table uh, for you. This afternoon, the service down in, in Moss Side Presbyterian, with the focus on particular additional needs. Uh, that's how it's titled, Additional Needs Service of Worship. Three o'clock this afternoon, that's open to everyone. Uh, that's this afternoon. Then this evening, 7.30, here in the meeting house, and then a cup of tea in the hall afterwards, or in the minor hall afterwards. And look forward to hearing from some of those involved in summer outreach over, over these past weeks and those that were away at youth camps as well. So we will be hearing from a number of the young people this evening and we'd love to see you as we gather together to seek the Lord. Sunday school will be starting then next Sunday, God willing, speak to Mark or any of the other teachers involved. Uh, next Sunday morning, 11 o'clock Sunday school, Bible class recommencing again. And then the midweek meeting on Wednesday in the minor hall here for Bible study and prayer, and again, that's open to everyone uh, from 8 to 9 on Wednesday evening. Our call to worship coming from Romans 1 this morning in verses 16 to 17, and the Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, our righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And so it is the gospel that draws us together. It is the gospel of our Lord Jesus that holds us together. As we worship God, it is with this gospel of Jesus uh, on our minds and hopefully in our hearts, this, this great reality of God's love, God's redeeming love for sinners like me and you. What a wonderful saviour is Jesus. So we come to worship. We're going to sing... Uh, a portion of Psalm 145, verses 1 to 6, the second version, and then be still for the presence of the Lord. And stand to sing, let us worship God. <laughs>
Let's come to God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank and praise you for your great mercy, your grace to us this day afresh, the wonder of your redeeming love. We thank you, O God, that we can sing these psalms and hymns of praise flowing out of your word. Lord, we thank you that we have truth to sing and to rejoice in. And Lord, we thank you that you draw near in your tender mercy to the like of us. Father, may we be aware of the nearness of your gracious presence this day as we meet here, even more aware than we are of the presence of others around about us. Close us in with yourself, we pray. Move by your Spirit in our hearts and our lives, for we need you, Lord. And we're dry and we're barren apart from you. You are the life giver. You are life in all its fullness. And so we cry out for you, the living God. Father, we're reminded of your holiness. We are reminded, Lord, of your glory and your power. We're reminded, Lord, that there's no work too difficult for you. Nothing, not, none of us are too difficult for you to deal with. Lord, we confess we're difficult people and we're often stubborn and rebellious and we want our own way and we do our own thing and we have little thought for the good of others and little thought for the glory of your name. And we pray, forgive us, Lord, our many sins. Grant us repentant hearts. Cleanse us, O Lord, afresh by the blood of Jesus and grant us that close walk with you that would want to look to the needs of others and want to look for the glory of your name. So realign our lives as we gather here. We thank you for this one day in seven that you've gifted to us. O oh Lord, may it be precious to us because you're precious, because the Lord of the day is precious. So Lord, may our hearts be captivated, our minds captivated this day, not only as we gather here in the meeting house, but as we go our separate ways or even for others that are following on and recordings of service unable to be with us here. Lord, may our hearts be captivated this day with you and your glory. May we speak of you much, even speaking to ourselves of you and speaking to others in our homes or families or those we meet along the way, letting them know that Jesus is our precious Savior and Lord. May we be praising you, singing and making melody even in our hearts to you. Put that song of joy in our hearts, Lord, no matter what might be your circumstance. Put that song in our hearts afresh, even as we're reminded in recent days of Paul and Silas in a prison cell singing praise unto God. And all the others in there heard, heard as they poured out their hearts in prayer and heard as they poured out their hearts in praise to you. And so, Father, may we be effective, faithful, humble witnesses to your saving grace. Thank you for the fellowship of your people, for brothers and sisters in Jesus who love us and are patient with us, and for those who have set us an example in Christ-likeness. Thank you for those who have prayed for us and continue to pray for us. Even unbeknown to us, they uphold us before your throne of grace. Thank you, Lord, for so many mercies, for your word that has been opened up to us over a lifetime, Lord, we thank you. And we thank you for that gracious work of your Holy Spirit, bringing that word home to our hearts. And we pray for that work today afresh in our lives. Give us a hunger and appetite for you and your word. Lord, as we gather to praise you here, we're mindful of brothers and sisters around the world in different time zones throughout this Lord's day, praising your holy name. And how that thrills our hearts to think of all these dear souls that you're gathering to yourself. And we're mindful, Lord, that as we sing your praise on earth, we join with the song of the souls of the redeemed in heaven, praising you even more fully in your nearer presence, joining with the angels who do your bidding. And yet the souls of the redeemed were reminded in Revelation 6, cry out, how long? for their yearning for the fullness of it all at Christ's return when we will all be united as one body with Christ in glory land. And so, Lord, may we yearn also for the coming of our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
<coughs> We're reading from Psalm 14 and then Romans chapter 3. <coughs> Romans 3 verses 9 onwards. But Psalm 14 is... We continue studies in these opening psalms. <clears throat> Psalm 14, let us hear God's word. To the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. And the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Then turning to Romans 3, where this portion of scripture is picked up and quoted. Romans 3, verses 9 to 20. <coughs> After the Gospels and Acts, you come to Romans. <clears throat> Romans 3 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul, writing by the Spirit of God, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Amen. And we thank God for his precious word. If the girls and boys come to the front for a few moments, please. <clears throat> Hello, and thank you for coming forward, and good to see you. And are you back at school? Or some of you, you're all, are you at school? Back at school? Is it going well? Some, some going okay. It's okay. It has to be done, doesn't it? After your summer holidays, it's sometimes hard to go back. I used to miss friends at the end of June when I we went off school. And then when I got to September, I was just so happy at home, I didn't really want to go back to school. That's how happy I was at home, out, out getting on with things out on the farm at home. But school's to help us and precious, and we need to learn. And you know, I'm still at school. I'm in the school of life, and I hope I'll be learning all the days. I'm in the scene of time. Even when you get through school and you go to college or university or whatever it is, when you leave all of that and you think you finally got through it, you'll still be learning, I hope. You'll still be in school in one way or another. Still be in the school of life. And, you know, I couldn't wait to get away from school and finished it. And I went to Greenmount, couldn't wait to get that finished either. And then I got a job that I never expected. I asked to go for an interview and I went and they gave me the job. And I thought, how did this come about? But I was praying that the Lord would guide me. And I ended up working in a meat plant, a meat factory in Oma for two years. And I would say it was probably where I learned many, many, maybe most lessons. I learned many things in that place. You see, when you go on ahead after school and college into, into work or whatever you might do, you're still learning. And I began to learn an awful lot about people working in that factory. I look back at it and think, Wow, God taught me so much about myself and about other people. 
the school of life. And grown-ups still have to learn. We're still learning. And the Lord Jesus chose grown-up disciples. How many disciples followed him that we read of in particular? Twelve in particular and others outside of that. But one day they were gathered with him. I think it was outside Capernaum, this village, and he was teaching them. And something like this scene here, and, and he was teaching all these grown-ups. And oh, there may have been young people attached on at the outside of the thing too, but these grown-ups were learning. He was their teacher, their rabbi. These 12 had left everything and were following him. They were following close with him. He was walking with them and talking with them and teaching them. Do you want a, do you want a really big word that you can go home and talk to your parents about later? I would struggle to say this word. Peri. Can you say that bit? Peri. Peri. That's okay so far. Peripatetic. And somebody's going to tell me I haven't got it right. Peripatetic. Have you ever heard that word? That's a teacher who walks about and walks and teaches as they go. So Jesus walked along, went from place to place, and his disciples went with him, and he was teaching them. I was in a primary school not so long ago. Saw a teacher I knew when I went. I thought, she's not normally here. She was a peripatetic teacher. She went from school to school, helping them in a special way. She moved around. Well, Jesus moved around and his disciples moved with him. And as they went out, they saw all these things and they were learning lessons and things about life. Technology is getting readjusted here. And he was teaching. Now, do you ever go outside in your school for lessons outside, like looking at wildlife and nature, stuff like that? It's great to get outside. And Jesus was teaching his disciples. And one day at Capernaum, he asked them, do your teachers ask you questions? And you're hoping they won't. Hope they ask somebody else. He asked them the question, who do people say that I am? And do you know what they said? Some say you're Elijah come back from the dead, the prophet Elijah. Others say you're another prophet. Or they had all these answers. And then Jesus looked at them and said, but you, my disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter came back right away. Do you know what Simon Peter said? You're the Messiah, the Christ. You're the Lord's anointed. You're the Son of God. You're the special one we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah. And you know what Jesus said to Simon Peter? You didn't think that up yourself, Simon. In effect, this is what he said. God the Father showed you that. God the Father made you aware of that, Simon. God the Father opened your eyes spiritually to see and to know that I am the Messiah. Simon was learning. The other disciples were learning. They were learning more about Jesus and what it was to follow him. And girls and boys, you know what you discover as you get older in life? You forget a lot of the things that you've learned. I forget an awful lot of things. I'm forgetting names faster than I'm learning them at the minute. And you have to keep on learning and relearning. And sometimes the lessons you learn are things you have learned before and think, I have forgotten that. And God has to teach you patience. And he keeps on teaching us because he loves us. Jesus is our teacher. As we come to church Sunday by Sunday, we, we meet around the Bible and we want God the Holy Spirit to teach us because the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. We come to learn. And I hope you'll have an attitude of wanting to learn whether here at church or at home or at school. I still remember my first teacher at school. Would you believe that? I still remember my first teacher. Do you know what I remember about them? Their kindness. Their kindness. They just loved us and looked after us. And their kindness, I still can picture them. And all the wee things that were just unique about that particular teacher. Thank God when you have teachers that are kind to you and love you, and listen to them and learn from them. And when your parents try to teach you and love you, listen to them and learn from them. But think about the greatest teacher of all, our Lord Jesus, and listen to him and learn from him and follow him. Do what he tells us to do. We're going to sing the Lord's praise. Or maybe not. Have I lost, have I lost it all the day again? <coughs> Jonathan's coming to do what, what, what somebody else couldn't do, is that? <laughs> How many verses are there, Audrey, to that one? Give me the words. 
So that's thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, for loving me. That's no bother to you. You know, you know this one, anyway. You went to Calvary, there you died for me. Thank you. Yeah, you rose up from the grave to me, new life you give. You're listening and memorizing this. <laughs> Memories are useful. Who remembered that now? <laughs> right, we'll give it a go. We'll stand to sing. Well done. Thank you, John. We're sorted for another while. Uh, we continue to worship God with our tithes and offerings, and then after the choir sing the anthem, the little ones can go for children's church or for creche.
Thank you to the choir and to Audrey. In our prayers of intercession, uh, among others, we'll be thinking of that ministry into our schools through Scripture Union or CEF. Uh, Linda McCauley is the local worker here in this area from the area, and you know her well. Uh, we remember Linda and the work she's involved in, and then Catherine Ald, as far as I understand, is the, the new E3 worker for the North Coast area, uh, going into school, Scripture Union worker, that is, and she'd been serving previously as an intern and taking up that role now. So we, we pray for Catherine and the opportunities she'll have and for Linda as well. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you. We bring offerings to you, tithes, Lord, aware that all that we have comes from your gracious hand. And so may these things be tokens, Lord, that we want to lay our lives before you, that all that we are and all that we have is yours. And help us to live for you and your glory and to see the opportunities you're opening up for us week by week. And help us to take those opportunities in your strength. So prompt us by your spirit and guide us to people in the day, in the days that lie ahead. And make us aware of how to listen to, to others around about us and how to care for them and how to speak the truth in love. Lord, we pray for your help. That your children would be good witnesses for you, effective witnesses for you. Lord, how precious a thing it is to be able to point someone to the way everlasting, to the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray, Lord, for those openings and opportunities, and we pray for all our young people as they engage with friends at school and college or in workplaces. Lord, help them, encourage them, give them boldness to speak of you, help them to walk close with you and not to be pulled away by the, the, the flow of the world. Lord, the the, the peer pressure around about to pull us in all directions, and never mind what age we are, Lord, we feel it and the reality of it. To adjust our thinking to the thinking of the world, lest we stand out as being very different. But Lord, we thank you that you give us truth to build our lives upon. That we have the solid rock to build upon, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that your truth sets captives free. And so may we realize the power of your truth and lovingly bring it to bear upon our own lives and upon the lives of others to speak the truth in love. And so we pray, go before us and prepare the way. And we thank you that you not only go before us, but you're right here with us and you're the rear guard of your people. And Lord, we, we're amazed at just the way that you watch over us, that you indwell us, that you care for us. And we thank you this day for such amazing love. Father, we think of Linda and the work she does with Child Evangelism Fellowship, for all that has taken place over summer weeks and camps and for, for what took place even over the, the past school term, Lord, as well, with many opportunities to go into school to hold Bible clubs. And we pray, Lord, that that word that has been sown, the seed that has been sown, will continue to bring forth a harvest, that young lives will be pondering it, that the scriptures they received, they will be reading. And we pray, Lord, for Linda, that you'll guide her for the months that lie ahead and help her to divide her time wisely and to have energy physically and spiritually for the task. And, and we pray that you'll take her words and bless them into the lives of the young people she, she ministers to and to the adults she speaks to as well along the way. So encourage her in her own heart and soul and strengthen her this day. And Father, we pray that you'll raise up more of those laborers for the island of Ireland, that vision to have a worker in every county throughout this island. We pray that you'll continue to raise up those with a passion for your glory and for the salvation of children and young people. Lord, raise up and equip your servants. And Father, we think of Catherine and that new role she's taken up with Scripture Union in this region. And we ask that you would strengthen and encourage her. Thank you for how you've prepared her for that, even in the year that has passed. And Lord, create new opportunities for her, open new doors of opportunity into schools and colleges, and give her wisdom, Lord, as she meets with staff and pupils alike, and give her holy boldness, Father, we pray. Supply her needs and watch over her life, and grant her your encouragement. And we thank you for the work of Scripture Union. We pray, continue to encourage those in its leadership here within this island, and continue to guide. And we pray, Father, too, for the work of our Christian unions into colleges and universities. 
O oh Lord, that, that young people in our schools and colleges will see the need and the value to unite with other Christian young people to spur one another on, that they would be united around the gospel of our Lord Jesus, and that secondary things would be seen to be secondary, and the main thing would be kept the main thing, and your word would be binding them together by the power of your spirit. So, Father, grant that unity in our schools and colleges in the gospel, and grant that there will be a great move of your spirit to the salvation of souls. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, that another generation of young people will rise up to see that the Word of God is truth, and the Word of God brings light, and that they need and we need the Word of God. So, Father, move by your Spirit, we pray. As we bow before you, Lord, we pray for loved ones who are struggling. We name them in our hearts, those who are struggling to cope spiritually or mentally, emotionally, physically, Lord. They're feeling their brokenness and the pain of the heartaches of this scene of time. And we bring them to you and we ask, Lord, that you would use even this time of heartache and pain and grief to enable them to cast their very lives upon you by faith. And if they've already come to know you, Lord, that they will grow deeper in their walk with you. That they'll be enabled to say that God is good all of the time. And that God's purposes are for their good. So, Lord, grant them a strengthening of faith. Grant them, Lord, an enabling to trust even when they don't understand, just to, to leave it all with you. And to know and to be assured that you love them. Even when they can't figure out your providence and your purpose, that their mind's eye and their hearts would look back to the cross of Calvary and to be reassured that you love them so much that you gave your only begotten for them and their salvation. So what good thing will you withhold? O oh Lord, enable your people to trust you more and more. We ask that for ourselves, Lord, that we would be enabled to trust you more and more and that others will see that we trust you by the way we live. Lord, we pray for this island and for the peoples on it. Lord, we pray that there would be a turning toward heaven, a realization of our utter need of God. And we pray, Lord, raise up preachers of the word and teachers in our youth and children's ministries. Raise up people burdened for the place of prayer. Move by your Spirit among us, we pray, O Lord. And watch over those who seek to protect us. Protect them and grant that they would look to you for your protection. So even in these days of turmoil, may there be many within the PSNI looking unto Jesus and pointing others to do the same. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> When you think of school days and college and teachers and how they would try to teach and instruct us, <clears throat> and, and at times they would be asking the questions and hoping for answers coming back, pardon me. <clears throat> and I'm sure it must have been frustrating, and I'm sure it is frustrating for those who labor at teaching in schools and colleges, wondering what answers will come back when the questions are asked and imparting the information and hoping that lives will be impacted by it. And maybe you ask the question directly to one pupil or another and there's nothing coming back. And when you think of our Lord and the way he teaches us and he looks into our lives and he assesses us and our teachers, earthly teachers, assess us and weigh up what we're learning and what we're not and they maybe think, am I really teaching at all? And God looks into our lives, he the great teacher. And he looks in and examines us and he weighs us up <clears throat> and Psalm 14 speaks of that. Verse 2, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. The Lord looks down. This picture of God enthroned above and he looks down and he sees us all. Elsewhere in scripture we read of the Lord looking down upon the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. We're tiny in comparison, in other words. Our great and glorious God, his presence fills heaven and earth and more. And he looks down at us human beings like, like a dot of sand on the seashore. 
so tiny in comparison to the greatness of God. And he looks down from heaven on the children of man, on mankind whom he has made, and he's made for a glorious purpose, to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God, And we read of a despairing situation, a despairing scene. For we see the Lord's view of mankind as he searches us out, and it's not a pretty picture. And so important is it for us to realize all of this, that we have Psalm 14 virtually repeated in Psalm 53. So this psalm is virtually, to, to the word, repeated twice in our Psalter. Romans 3, it's there repeated, much of it. So important is this. It's not that the the psalmist David was just having a gloomy day in regards to people or in regards to himself. I'm sure he had many a gloomy day. But God by the Spirit is bringing his word through David. This psalm is a psalm of David for the choir master. And the people of God are to sing about the the sinfulness and the the sadness of the state of mankind. We're to, to make it known to memorize it to repeat it in other words and it's the lord's view of mankind and god shows us what we're like so that we might understand what we are like as people god shows us our hearts he teaches us what we're like and what he is like and we see what we're like in the in 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 the presence of god in the holy presence of god we realize that we by nature are not holy First of all, God reveals to us that we are a people who deny the truth. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Denying the truth. Because God has set it into the heart of man that there is a God. It's within every human being, that awareness that there is a God. And you see it in atheists, people who say they're atheists. You see it in their lives at times when... when, heartache comes and they look in all directions for help or when bereavement comes and they're still hoping that their bereaved loved one who they think was just a a material being with no spiritual sight and they're, they're hoping that loved one is in a better place even though they don't believe there's a God or a better place there, there's still an awareness within an awareness within but the fool says in his heart there is no God so We by nature are foolish people because this fool is not just the the one or two out there. This is all of us. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. None of us who do good. And it's a sobering description of the state of humanity apart from God or cut off from God. The fool says in his heart, that word for fool there, it's not someone who's uneducated. It's not someone who's illiterate. It's it's a, a word describing someone who's aggressive in their ungodliness, who's aggressive against God and his truth. And so the fool says in his heart, in the very depth of his being, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable deeds. The heart is the the control seat of the person, so to speak. The very inner being saying there is no God. And Just notice for a moment that it's in the heart this person saying there is no God. So it's quite possible that they believe there is a God. They could well be religious people. They could be part of a Christian church or fellowship or some other religion and believing in a God or more than one God perhaps. But in their heart... They're saying there is no God. And it's a sobering thought for those of us who say we know and love the Lord, that in our heart we could be living as if we were saying there is no God. Because we want to rule in our hearts rather than the Lord ruling. And God, looking down at us as we peer into the universe to search out the meaning of life, with all our scientific advances and all the philosophical ability of great and learned minds, God is looking down. People looking out into the world and looking out into space and trying to make sense of the mysteries of time and eternity and trying to understand. And God is looking down and he searches us out and he sees us. And he says of mankind, 
people who deny the truth. You sometimes wonder why people do the things they do and believe the things they believe, even though the evidence all around shouts out something different. Romans 1 makes it clear that people would rather believe a lie than believe the truth, because if you believe the truth, it has implications for you in terms of your behavior and what you're going to do in life. It's a bit like someone in a in a situation, a relationship, whether it's in work or at home or whatever, and the person would rather believe the lie about the person, the colleague or the loved one, rather than believe the truth, because if they're going to believe the truth, it's going to impact their whole life. It's going to turn their lives upside down. And they would rather believe the lie and the delusion rather than the truth. <clears throat> and so people would rather believe that there is no God than to acknowledge that there is a God to whom I am accountable. And so many, many people live with that delusion, that lie, rather than the truth. And God knows it and he points it out and he makes us aware of it. And it is a fool who says in his heart, there is no God. Secondly, we see here that as God looks upon us, not only denying the truth, but there is this desiring of wickedness. Verses 1 and 2 speak of that. Doing abominable deeds. Why do we as people do the wicked things we do? It's easy to look out in and beyond and out into the world and see the horrible things that happen. And why, do, why do those things happen? Why does wickedness abound? Why do we do wicked things? As we bring it back home, why do we hurt the people we love? Why do we break promise with the people we love and make promises to? Because we are sinful people. <clears throat> because we desire wickedness. <clears throat> Rather than righteousness, we desire wickedness. And we do not call upon the Lord. Verse 3 says, we have all turned aside. Together we have become corrupt. We corrupt one another as we gather together. In society we see that. There is none who does good, not even one. And David's referring to himself in that regard as well. He's including himself. Verse 2, there's no one who, who seeks after God. You know, in all our seeking of God, by nature we do not seek God for God's sake. We seek God for our sake, don't we, by nature, until God intervenes. We seek God for our sake rather than for his sake, rather than to give him glory. And so the reality of human nature is sobering, it's frightening, it's depressing. And you're saying, I was downcast already before I came here today, Philip, and you're not really helping any. This is the reality of how God sees human nature. Deniers of truth. Desiring wickedness, desiring wickedness. Horrible, isn't it? That you or I, we might desire the wicked thing or the wicked way rather than the righteous way. And yet that's the reality of what we're like by nature. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Maybe we're living with, if others were to look on and sum up our life, they would say, you're living as if there's no God. You're in effect saying in your heart, there is no God. You don't want God to rule over you and control your life. And you don't want to live by standards and bring your life under his standards. You want it your way and in your timing, not God's. You don't really want to know him. You just want him to bring blessing into your life. And so we are a people by nature who deny truth, who desire wickedness. Then thirdly, we are a people who are depraved or corrupt. Verse 3 speaks of that. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. That corruption, that depravity, we, we use the word depravity and we are inclined to think of the most wicked of people, the most evil of people, and we reserve the word for, for them. And hopefully we don't fall into that category as how we think of it. But all of us, all together, have become corrupt. When you think of all your technological devices and you try to protect them from viruses and malware or whatever all it might be, and 
and you hate the thought of all that stuff coming in and crashing and bringing a crash down and, and it, it permeates every aspect of the equipment it seems. And with sin it, it gets to every aspect of human nature. It corrupts our thoughts, our actions, our wills, our emotions. You've heard that phrase, original sin, and you maybe think it just goes back to Adam sinning and originally, and yes, that's part of it, it's to do with Adam. But that teaching of original sin is saying that because Adam sinned as our first parent, all of us have inherited a sinful nature. Do I have met Christians over the years who don't believe that, who think original sin and that doctrine is not biblical, that we are inherently good by nature, we're born good. And I just look at them and think, where did you grow up? Now, some of them are related to me, so I just think, where did you grow up? And I know where they grew up, and they didn't grow up in, in an environment where all was good. And they didn't certainly grow up all good, nor did I, nor did you. Sometimes you might say, I don't know about you, but I know about me. Nobody needed to teach me how to sin, but I do know about you, and I know about me. No one needed to teach you or me how to sin. We were born with a sinful nature. Because of Adam's sin, Adam is our first parent, the head of the human race, so to speak. When he sinned, we all fell in him, and we all inherited that sinful nature. And you'll not make sense of life and your life in the world until we grasp all of that and come to terms with it and acknowledge it. Original sin, we, we were born in sin, shaping in iniquity, said King David. That reality of inheriting a sinful nature, self-centered, self on the throne. Little children don't need to be taught how to rebel against loving parents or teachers or, or friends. Don't need to be taught. Oh, we may pick up from others other, a few new ideas along the way, but we don't need to be taught how to rebel. We may teach others a few new ideas along the way of how to rebel and how to sin, but that is there from, from, from not only birth, from conception, that sinful nature is there that reality of our fallenness. And that corruption in days of Reformation, as Bible teachers were grappling with truth and rediscovering the apostolic gospel, they spoke of, of mankind, or some of them spoke of this teaching of total depravity. Now, it wasn't that they were all very gloomy. They were, they were delighting in the Lord and his gospel and salvation, but they were studying the scriptures, the likes of Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Romans 3, different passages of scripture that speak of the, the fallenness, the brokenness of humanity. And they were drawing out doctrines as a result from all of that. And when they spoke of total depravity, they weren't saying that your life and all human life is as bad as it could possibly be, as wicked as it possibly be. By total depravity, they were saying every aspect of our being is affected by sin. Our emotions, our wills, our attitudes, physically, every aspect of our lives are affected by sin. Totally, this depravity, this corruption has entered in and corrupted us. And God's word makes that clear. Psalm 14 makes it clear. Corrupt hearts lead to corrupt actions. Corrupt thoughts lead to corrupt actions. No one doing good, not even one. That's God's inspection report of his world in a fallen world, a world in rebellion against him. No one does good, not even one. And King David can include himself in all of that, very aware of the reality of it, the reality of his sin, and his life, as we think of his life, remind us of the danger of sin luring and lurking and seeking to devour. A people doomed, in effect, because of all of that by nature. In great terror, they seek, verse 4 speaks of those who are opposed to God's people seeking to devour them, to eat them up. You ever notice that, the animosity that so often arises within your home maybe or within your circle of friends or colleagues when you come to know Christ as your saviour and you let them know and you probably don't let them know in the best of ways. You, you struggle to get the words out and maybe it doesn't come across the way you intended and, and they take it in the wrong way but 
But oftentimes an animosity, even if you were to say it in the most gracious of way that you've come to Christ, an animosity creeps in. Why does it creep in? Because in effect you're saying to them that they're not right. That their lives aren't right and they need to get right with God and it's, it's impacting their conscience and they're feeling it. And pray God a conviction of sin is coming and stirring up within them an awareness of their need. But initially the animosity comes and they maybe stop talking to you and they don't want to be friends with you and within a home a tension can arise that can be hard to bear because by nature there is a hatred for the Lord's people. And by nature we're doomed and lost and there are these two groups of people here, the Lord's people and those who are rebellious against the Lord and remain in their rebellion. But thankfully, we discover here in verse 7 that there is hope, there is salvation. It was the cry of King David as he wrote this psalm. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. That salvation would come, that Yeshua would come, that Jesus would come. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Israel's a new name for Jacob. It's the same people that's been spoken of here, the Lord's people, the Lord's chosen people. Jacob or Israel, it's just repetition. Let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Even though Jacob and Israel know the depth of their own sin, never mind the sins of others as they look out into the world. Even though King David feels the reality and the pain and the heartache of his own sin, the heartache it has brought upon others, even loved ones, and a loved nation. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. King David, crying out of the depths of his heart for this salvation, this Yeshua, this Jesus to come that the Messiah would come. He knew, King David knew, he was looking forward to the coming of the Lord's anointed, one far greater than David, a son of David, but far greater than David, one who would live the righteous life. You see, up to this point, David's writing, there's none who does good, not even one. But our Lord Jesus Christ came, and he did good. He, the righteous one, he, the human who lived the perfect life, the only one who lived the perfect life always. And he came for us and our salvation. Salvation has come out of Zion. Our Lord Jesus laid down his life to redeem us, the righteous one bearing our sins. And so we rejoice this day. With the Israel of old, we rejoice that salvation has come for us. You never really realize your need of a saviour until you see your seriousness in your sin, the seriousness of your sin. You'll never understand the world in which you live in the present age or any age and the corrupt things that happen until you realize the sinfulness of sin, the impact of sin, the wickedness that abounds within all our hearts. You never make sense of it all. And when we speak of that reality of total depravity or original sin and sin affecting every area of our being, it doesn't mean that you are as wicked as you might be. Why not? Because God in his mercy restrains the wickedness of your or my heart. Oh, when God lifts the restraint. When God hands us over to our sin, that's a frightening thing. Romans 1, 3 times speaks of God giving people over to their sin and their sinful desires. And when God lifts off his restraint and hands us over to our sin, that's a frightening thing frightening to be in that place and even to see society going that way. But God in his mercy restrains the wickedness of our hearts. He's been doing that for you since the day you were born. He has put others around you to restrain the wickedness of your heart. He's given laws in his word and in, in our land to restrain us. The, the law of the land gives you an example of how God uses his law to restrain us. So we're driving along and we see a speed limit sign and and we see the picture of a child or an old person or whatever, and, and we know we slow down, we need to slow down, and hopefully we get slowed down in time. And, and we slow down because there's something there to restrain us. 
But times we don't get slowed down quickly enough and we're reminded that we're lawbreakers, even though this restraint's there. And God gives us other people around us and a conscience within us to restrain the wickedness of our heart and, and even the, the awareness of what society might think and at, and at times in society when God's law is having more impact then society restrains other lives because we don't want to be thought little of by society so that restrains us. Now when society lifts off its restraint and says I don't need God's law or any of the commandments then you see wickedness more and more abounding for that restraint is gone. But God restrains the wickedness of our hearts. And not only does God do that in his mercy, he also enables sinful, wicked people like me or you to do things for the good of others. That's his common grace we speak of, distinct from saving grace. So God's common grace coming to believer and unbeliever alike. He sends the sun and the rain and the righteous and the wicked. And so he gives gifts and abilities to people so you're trying to make sense of things and say, well, that person you're speaking of there, they're, they're corrupt and sinful, but yet I know they care for people and they do good things. And how is that possible? That's by God's mercy. It's common grace enabling them to do things that are for the good of others. And so if I end up in hospital and need surgery, I'm not going to say it must be a Christian surgeon filled with the Spirit who's going to operate on me or therefore I'll not be there. Now, I understand some people have that outlook and I respect it, but all I want to know is, is that surgeon qualified to do the surgery? Because God gives gifts to people, whether they're atheists or agnostics or whatever religious background, he gives skills and abilities for the good of all to people. And that's his mercy. That's in spite of the wickedness of our hearts, the sinfulness of our hearts. We struggle to understand until we have the light of God's word, to understand the society in which we live and to understand our own hearts, bringing it back to, to your own self, trying to make sense of yourself. That's a hard thing, isn't it? All our people struggle to make sense of us. We can't even make sense of ourselves, why we do the things we do, why we leave undone the things we leave undone. And this reality of the sinfulness of our being to the core and but for the mercy of God, where would we be? But praise God, salvation for Israel, for us, has come out of Zion. And this salvation is not only for Jew, but for Gentiles, for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus has come out of Zion, having lived the perfect life, laid it down to pay the wages of our sin. And so our hearts rejoice that he bore our sin in his body on the cross. I've heard people over the years, pastors speaking about their flock and saying something in effect like this. My good people deserve better than this. Whatever's happening around them and to them, my good people deserve better. And I'm thinking, there's something badly flawed here in all of this because we're not good people by nature. And if we got what we deserved, we would be getting something far worse than the thing that we're lamenting. We're not good by nature. Know what we deserve. Do you really believe what you deserve from God? Do you really believe this? Because if you don't believe this, you're saying in your heart there is no God. Do you really believe that you deserve hell for your sins? Do you really believe that? Or do you think that you're good and you're not like the wicked? We are sinful, and God is holy, and we deserve his wrath. But praise God, Jesus has borne that wrath in his body on the cross, and there is salvation for you and me as we put our trust in Christ. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, but God in his great mercy reaches out to fools and saves them. Praise his holy name. We'll sing in closing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.